Super Predator, a word used to demonize a generation of black youth. A super predator is a young juvenile criminal. A toxic myth that turned juveniles into targets for national leaders on both ends of the political spectrum. I would say to, to juveniles, there are no violent offenses that are juvenile. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. Today, we explore the roots of the term, how it came to falsely brand so many, and the role it played in bringing out harsher juvenile sentences in this country. All that and more on this episode of Inside Story. Welcome to Inside Story. I'm Lawrence Bartley. And unfortunately, I was incarcerated for 27 years. But since my release, I've been working with the Marshall Project covering criminal justice. It is our mission here at Inside Story to bring in-depth coverage of criminal justice issues that matter most to you. We were inspired to explore this subject after reading this article, co-authored by Carol Bogart, president of the Marshall Project. Carol joins us now to discuss what she discovered when reporting her story. Thank you for joining us. Before we get into the details of your piece, can you define the term super predator for me? Mm. Super predator is really a made up word. It's a word that comes from the animal world. A predator is somebody, you know, like a tiger or a hawk that is stalking its prey. And I think when we see this word being applied to children, it really is a very dehumanizing term. What's it meant to refer to? What it refers to supposedly is young people who kill without conscience, have no moral core. And because juvenile arrest rates were very high in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, and people, I think, were struggling to understand what was happening. And instead of looking at factors like increased availability of guns or lack of jobs or other alternatives in the community, they really put the burden on and identified the problem as these people. These are people without moral bearings. And I think the beginning of the problem is that you would even think about describing a human being as an animal. As I understand it, the term first came to life when a professor at Princeton University wrote this article in 1995 in a magazine called The Weekly Standard. In it, he made a case based upon data he claimed that juvenile crime was about to explode. He wasn't really a statistics guy, but he used statistics to predict that there were going to be tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands more teens on the streets committing crimes in just five years time or 10 years time. He made very specific projections. And what he was assuming was that a certain percentage of teens are just gonna be these kind of violent criminals because they are super predators and they're bad. We know that later this theory turned out to be completely wrong, but at the time it spread like wildfire, didn't it? The word just went everywhere. And the magazine where it was originally published didn't have a very big circulation, but the magazines that picked it up did, and the newspapers and the television. And it was a word that could be used in a headline and it was eye-catching. So the fact that it was wrong, the fact that juvenile arrests were already falling in 1995 when he published this article, the fact that the statistics did not hold up, all of that just fell away because Super Predator was such a kind of juicy, exciting, provocative word. And it hooked the media and it hooked a lot of people and it did a lot of damage. What is it with this animal imagery? It was Super Predator and before that it was Wilding and Wolfpack. Was it that it allowed people to suspend their empathy for black children? Is that the real hitting meaning behind a word like that? Yeah, I think it's very bound up with race and the history of racism in our country. And 
the use of animal terms to describe African Americans, especially African American men, that has a long and very ugly history in our country. And it was one of those code words where nobody said this is necessarily about black people, but it was kind of understood like a, like a dog whistle, as they say. Super predators meant black teenagers. And it scooped up you know, Latinx and white teenagers and Asian teenagers and all kinds of people in that term. But it, it has really, I think, a, a racist core. No, all right, so how did it pan out? The crime rate is going down. Um, everyone is using a super predator term. It's, it's going through the media like wildfire. What did that do to the criminal justice system at the time? I spoke with lawyers who were, you know, representing kids in courtrooms in that period in the mid to late 90s. And they said, wow, the atmosphere just got so much worse. They could feel like the judges, the prosecutors were just looking at their clients, their teenage clients and thinking to themselves, super predator. And we spoke to many people who committed crimes when they were children in the 1990s and what it felt like to be labeled a super predator when you're a child. It's a term that says to you, you're garbage, you're not human, you're, you're, you're outside uh, civilized human society. So it did, a, it did a lot of damage to people who had that term applied to them. Thank you, Carol. I really appreciate what you shared with us today, and thank you for joining us. So many of those young people who are labeled super predators were coming from homes where they had already suffered a lot of trauma. A prime example of this is Catherine Jones, who was arrested at the age of 13 and sent to prison for nearly 20 years. She and her younger brother were molested throughout their childhood by a family member. After searching for help, Catherine came to the conclusion that their only way out would be to stop the abuse themselves. Were you ever called a super predator? Yes, I, I remember Super Predator, the first um, time I heard that, I was walking into the detention center after I had booked in the rain, and everyone was sitting around a television, and my face is up there, and that was the label that was underneath there. And I remember already feeling like some type of caged animal, and um, little by little, those labels began to chip at my identity and those characteristics that I held dear for 13 years, which was a daughter, a sister, a, ne a niece, a friend, a student. And um, slowly I began to wear those labels and become a product of, that, of those labels that were placed on me. I remember reading somewhere that you said when you were arrested, there were more media trucks there than police cars. What does that say mm -hmm. to you? Um, I remember when we were hiding um, in the woods, we would see news vehicles with spotlights on the top looking. And I think the goal was to like be the first one to spot us. They were vultures. They weren't really there as allies or friends. And they're screaming out all of these questions. And of course, my 13 year old brain is just overwhelmed because now they're separating me and my brother. They're putting him in one car and me in another. And I'm screaming for, them to bring him back, not to take him away. And all of this is caught on camera. All of this is caught in the news. And once we came to the police station and were questioned and came out, and they were aggressive to the point where they were, the, their cameras were like right in our face. And you have the, the two detectives like standing behind us, like they were bringing out some type of prize trophy. And um, it was probably one of the most dehumanizing experiences of my life. There's a, photo of you being walked into the court and you had handcuffs on. Can you tell us what's going through your 13 year old mind at that moment? That was actually the day that I took my plea bargain. And I was devastated because um, they had kicked my family out because my brother went in prior to me. And of course there was outrage at the question being asked, did he understand that he had an 18 year sentence in life probation. So um, they had um, asked my family to leave. So when I came in, there was nobody there. And the full weight of what was about to happen, the fact that I was gonna spend 18 years in prison was overwhelming for me. 
Um, it caused me to have an emotional breakdown. And prior to that, I had done a good job of always having like a brave face because I always went to court with my brother and I wanted to be strong. And um, I seen the, you know, the newspaper articles that came out after my court appearance saying I was cold and calculated. And, and <laughs> once again, that was what their perception of the truth was. The truth was that I was trying to be strong for my sibling and for my family because I felt like I had caused all this pain. And that showing strength and courage through it would help ease their burden of feeling like, um, of being worried about me as a 13 year old inside of an adult jail. So they put you with the adults right away at 13 years old? Yes. It was like being forced into adulthood way before you want to. There was a part of me that was still this kid that wanted to be able to call my mom and dad and ask them to save me from this, right? That wanted me to be able um, to be held and loved and all of those things were stripped away. And now I'm told that I can make my own legal decisions even though I had no knowledge of the criminal justice system. Um, I'm told that I have to learn to nurture and care for myself and um, being told that any of the trauma that I had experienced prior to that, there would be no resources like it all depended on me which was a lot which was more than any 13 year old should have to bear so you've been out for five years now and i know you had a lot of time to reflect on the label super predator and how it personally impacted you i think lawrence that the one thing that has to be very very clear that this theory was one disproven and the, the fact that there was, you know, there's these fearless, godless, fatherless monsters that are running around ready to terrorize your neighborhood wasn't real. The goal of it was to make it where we weren't children. Because if if we had to be honest and say these are 13, 14, 15, 16 year old children that we're dealing with, you can't justify um, treating them in such an inhumane way. So what do you say today to people who, who look at you and say, well, I still think she's a super predator? What do you say today to those folks? Um, if you see me in Walmart with my two children, you would never know what my past was. You would never know that at 13 I had committed murder. You would see me as a mom wrestling with two toddlers to try to survive a Walmart shopping trip. I am a mother. I am a person. I am not remorseless. <laughs> I think every day of the um, mistake that I made that cost someone their life that deeply hurt a, another family beyond, I can't even put into words the ramifications of what I did. But because I had that second chance to come out here, I get to live out a life of eternal apology because I had that chance. I had a release date and there's so many people that don't, that deserve it because how else will they, will justice happen? How can they make amends to the society and the community and the families that they hurt. And so um, now I advocate for that. And that's what I am, a mom and an advocate for other kids like me that don't deserve to die in prison. They don't deserve to spend the best years of their life when we have the ability as a society to, to help rehabilitate and heal these children instead of punishing them and, and deeming them worthless. Thank you, Catherine. It was such a pleasure having you to be a guest on our show today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence. We now turn to Eli Hager, staff writer at the Marshall Project. Eli, this term super predator was first conceived of 25 years ago. What can you tell us about its impact on the juvenile criminal justice system? I think the term definitely has impact, but more broadly than the term itself is an attitude toward black kids and brown kids that's existed in the juvenile justice system since long before that term was invented. So even though the term was invented in 1995, you're saying that the country had already began to treat juveniles harshly and the term simply described a mindset that was already there? Yeah, that's how I would put it. I mean, I think all through the 70s and 80s and early 90s, that's when states were passing laws that were much tougher on juveniles, um, allowing kids as young as 13 
uh, to be tried as adults with adult consequences and adult prison sentences. And then in 1995, that term super predator was coined um, and it just made things worse. But is it fair to say that the term super predator had paved the way for harsher treatment of juveniles in this country? So uh, certainly it has. Um, we know from our reporting uh, at the Marshall Project that after that term was used, judges and prosecutors were more likely to sentence kids, especially kids of color, harshly. And that often was because judges and prosecutors view black kids as being older than they are, um, according to psychological research. Um, they see a 14-year-old black child and they think the person is older and more culpable of crime than a white 14-year-old. And that all arose out of seeing kids as super predators, which is obviously a, a false concept. What do you say to people who might believe that all this talk of racism and the unfair treatment of juveniles misses the point? Some black kids committed horrible crimes and their victims deserve justice. Well, I would say I would say to look inward and think about who you were as a 15 year old or 16 year old and the kinds of impulsive decisions that you were making and think about how you are now. And that's my second point is that we've had a lot of new brain science lately um, that shows that people's brains change dramatically, um, you know, from their younger years through young adulthood and then into being um, more mature adults. They're much less likely to take risks. They're much more likely to say no to peer pressure. They're much more um, engaged in their communities. So the last question I would ask you is, how do we as a society and a criminal justice system protect ourselves against terms like super predator that are toxic and they take root and they wield such power? How do we stop it from happening again? Well, I think the media especially have to be very careful about reacting too strongly when there is a wave of crime. Because you have to remember that a lot of this ar arose from the fact that there was a crime wave in the, in the 80s and 90s that was, that was legitimately happening. Um, and the media got very scared and they used sensationalist rhetoric. And I think that um, the media needs to be self-aware about not um, overreacting to an uptick in crime and starting to use that kind of same sensationalist rhetoric because when the public is scared, really harsh criminal justice policies are what happen as a consequence. Eli Hager, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. We truly appreciate you. Super Predator, the word partially responsible for the harsh sentencing of black children. I am no stranger to harsh sentences. I received one myself as a member of the young generation used to give birth to the term. Looking back, it is clear that the officers who arrested me didn't see me as a 17-year-old kid. No social worker was there to walk me into police custody. No one coached me out of hiding. Instead, I was pulled into the street and greeted by spotlights and fire-eyed detectives. They handled me like sportsmen and did everything short of high fives and butt claps. It wasn't until years later that I realized that they behaved like hunters, and to them, I was caught game. Not human, not someone's son, but a thing unworthy of care. I know some people will rightfully say, what about care for those who are hurt? Roles seem to be confused here. I deeply think that the suffering of victims should be heavily weighed. I also think that most, if not all, incarcerated people were victimized themselves before ever committing a crime. So when we consider the suffering and loss of victims at sentencing, isn't it fair that we include the gruesome childhoods of those we are about to incarcerate? Years after John DeJulio invented the term super predator, he disavowed it. He even sent a special statement to the U.S. Supreme Court encouraging juvenile justice reform. But there are still thousands of kids whose lives and future generations will forever be hampered by the power and reach of his fable. And to them I say, your humanity may be attacked, defaced, and cruelly ignored, but it can never be taken away unless it is surrendered.
My name is Lawrence Bartley, and this has been Inside Story.